All right, we got the thumbs up from the studio. We're good to go. Uh, so for those of you who are just joining us, uh, or perhaps for those of you, oh, okay, my kids are fleeing. I do want to actually make one special little thing here. Uh, for anybody who has uh, taken a look at the online service or has joined us online uh, and you've noticed that the sound has been super quiet, uh, hopefully I've got that tweaked. Uh, I would appreciate any feedback that you would give us so that we can continue to make that better and better. Uh, we want to make sure that we're serving people as well as we can, uh, at any avenue that we can. So if you're joining us online, we see you. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully you can actually hear me because I can't learn sign language. My hands are too stiff. So if you're just joining us or if you would like to appreciate just a quick refresher on where we've been in the last few weeks, uh, we are currently in a series that we're calling At the Core. And it's a series on theology and the inspiration was rooted uh, for this one. The way, that, sort of the thing that inspired this a little bit was uh, 1 Peter 3, 15, which says, In your hearts, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I believe that theology is a tool or a lens on the world that followers of Jesus need to engage with deeply and intentionally because good theology anchors us and builds up our faith and gives us the ability to share our faith with confidence, clarity, and love. It's something that's incredibly important for followers of Jesus to work out our faith with fear and trembling. And that being said, with so much diversity in the church and so much of Scripture that's up for interpretation, and we can't deny the fact that it, there's a lot of this that can be a little contentious even inside of the church, we kind of ask the question, how can the church carry out the work of advancing God's kingdom in unity and confidence that we are speaking the truth faithfully? that we're not wandering off the path. This is kind of the way that I've pictured it in my own mind. While there is much in Scripture that is up for interpretation, there are some things at the core of the gospel that are not up for debate, things that we can be sure of, firm soil to plant ourselves in. It's those things at the core that we can hold to in order to keep our faith grounded in the truth in a very similar, the way that I picture it is like satellites orbiting a planet caught in that gravity. Satellites orbiting in the hold of a planet's gravity. So far, we've worked through two of those core things. Div the divine inspiration of Scripture, and two weeks ago, Jim walked us through how the pillars of cre in the pillars, or sorry, at the pillars of creation, we find the gospel is front and center. And this week, we're going to be talking about another core truth that the Bible reveals, which is the nature of God. Now, when it comes to the nature of God, there are a lot of avenues to pursue, things that you can chase down, things that you can look to to try and define who God is, what he's like. The Bible is a big book. It's pretty thick. It takes me a year to get through it most of the time. And there are many different images and attributes used to describe God. For instance... We say that God is omnipotent, which means that he is powerful and able to do anything. Now, if that's true, and from Scripture we do believe that that is true, because it says that he's the eternal creator of everything seen and unseen, he is all-powerful, then can God do things that are even logically impossible? Is there something that's beyond his power, possibly? There's a problem called the omnipotence paradox, and it asks this, can God create something so big that he himself cannot move it? I like the modern rephrase of that, which is, can God microwave a burrito so hot that he himself cannot eat it? It's worth thinking about. It's a silly question. But it kind of asks the question, is there... Anything, if anything is possible for God, can he do things that are logically impossible? Is there a limit to his power? Now, there are a lot of questions like that, this that people have about God. Questions like, what does God look like? How is he everywhere all at once but here too? 
What's it like, what was it like for him before creation? How does it work for him to have no beginning? What's eternity like? How does he listen to all these prayers all at the same time in all these different languages? These are questions that the Bible isn't really, like it, it says that God is omnipotent, that he is omnipresent, which means that he's everywhere all at once. He's got all these attributes, but when it comes to what it looks like, the Bible is not terribly interested in answering some of these questions, which can be a little frustrating. In fact, the Bible has no problem saying that God is beyond our capability to comprehend. If you look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, it says this, to whom can you pr- compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? How can you describe God? How can you fit him into your box? It might sound like a non-answer, but the Bible has no problem saying that it's kind of useless trying to define the limits of God's power and knowledge and presence and even his form since he's beyond human comprehension. Questions that challenge our understanding of God might be interesting, and I'm not saying don't pursue those questions because I would love to find out what microwave setting God uses. It's okay to pursue some of those questions. Questions that challenge our understanding of God are interesting, but if God by definition is incomprehensible, then trying to fit him into a box is probably not helpful. And it's also one of those things Jim mentioned at the very beginning. Does it preach? Can you take it to other people? Can they build their faith on it? If you're asking questions out there like how many angels can fit on the head of the pin, you may have lost the plot. Doesn't quite preach. Is it useful? On the other hand, to say that we can't pursue the nature of God is also disingenuous because God has revealed himself to people. Romans 1 says that his invisible attributes are apparent in creation. And 2 Timothy 3 tells us that God has revealed himself to people through the inspired word of Scripture. So there must be something about God that we can know with confidence, something that we can know at the core that we can take to others, something that we can build our faith on, and something that we can share with others with confidence. So what can we say we know of God for sure if so much of his nature is ineffable or unexplainable or unfathomable? What can we say we know of? of God for sure. We're going to look into that a little bit in our passage for this morning. 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7. If you've got a Bible with you, I'll give you a second to get there. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's going to be up on the screen behind me. All the way at the very back. 1 John Chapter 4, starting at verse 7. It says this. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. At the core of God's nature, God is love. At first glance, that looks really simple, but it's really a big statement that informs a lot about what it means to be a follower of God, what it means for how God interacts with the universe, with individuals. The statement serves as ground or grounds for followers of God in a simple yet trustworthy anchoring truth. Apart from all of the things that we cannot quantify or fathom, We know for sure that Scripture reveals without ambiguity that the core nature of God is love. We're going to unpack that a little bit more together. Now to begin, we're going to establish some context for this passage because uh, you guys might be kind of like sick of the word context by this point in time. That's okay. I don't care. We're going to keep on doing it anyway. Uh, Establishing context is a good thing to do. It's an important thing to do because it ensures that we're applying Scripture faithfully. If we just go and pick something out and just try and read it on its own, that's a little bit like going and taking one text message and just going and saying, this is what you said. It's like you didn't look at the rest of the conversation. 
So we're going to put some context on this. The letters of John, so John 1, 2, and 3, the letters of John are not addressed to a specific church as far as we can tell. He just addresses it to his churches. What we do know for sure is that they were written or at least dictated by the Apostle John since the, in the opening of the letter he claims, uh, sorry, since uh, the opening of this letter claims that the author had firsthand, uh, was a firsthand witness to Jesus' divinity and resurrection. The person writing this letter saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The person that wrote this letter saw Je- that Jesus resurrected. The person who wrote this letter ministered alongside Jesus, was a close disciple. We believe that's the Apostle John. Now, as the early church spread through the Roman Empire, John and the other apostles spread out as well. Now, his pastoral ministry oversaw churches that were established up in Asia Minor, and I think I've got a picture of that up here. If anybody can't see that, I apologize, but this is the Mediterranean Sea. Down on the very uh, corner over here, that's Jerusalem down there in that, uh, that red circle or jalapeno pepper, whatever it is. That red mark up there, that's around the place where uh, John's, the, the congregations under John's leadership would have been. A place that we know as uh, in modern day Western Turkey. Now, as you can see from the map, that's quite far from the heart of Judaism, which is all the way down in Jerusalem. And remember, in a time before vehicles, this was quite a trek, even by boat. It's a long way off from the heart of Judaism. Excuse me meaning that the church communities under John's pastoral care, although established mostly in local synagogues, were a mixture of people from many backgrounds who were drawn together not because of a common history or because of commonalities in what they believed beforehand, but they were drawn together because of their, uh, their belief in Jesus and they were drawn together under John's leadership. A bunch of people didn't have a whole lot in common brought together under this common umbrella of believing in Jesus, and following John's teaching. So that being said, while the churches under John's leadership may have enjoyed, and we believe that they did, they did enjoy a period of peace and unity early on, it's also clear that later on, during the time when these letters were published, that deep division began to emerge that revolved around issues related to the identity of Jesus and the nature of God. As the debates got more and more heated, a split emerged in the church and people became hostile to one another and the church became fractured. John's epistles are letters written in response to this church crisis, a church that was fighting inside of itself, a church that was deeply divided, a church that had lost people due to huge splits, a church that had people trying to draw people away from it. These letters are in response to this crisis. He begins by establishing his theological credibility as an eyewitness to Jesus' divinity in chapter 1. And then he goes on to call these people in this church, in these churches, these squabbling people, he calls them back to what is at the heart of God's nature. He calls them back to love one another. Now, there are two major issues that John addresses in these letters, or in this letter specifically. He addresses bad theology that had popped up in the churches that leads away from the gospel, and he addresses a community so caught up in debates and conflict and infighting that they've lost their gospel witness. The call to love one another from John is in response to these two things, bad theology and just a church that, was completely, that had completely lost its witness. The call to love one another from John, we may look at it as just sort of like, come on guys, can we please just get along? Please just love one another. We might look at it as sort of this weak position for John to be taking. Can't you people just get along? But it's not. This is not a weak response to bad teaching that had been developed or that had developed in these churches. John doesn't mince words when it comes to living out the truth according to Scripture. He's not just sort of this soft-spoken person who sort of comes in and is sort of coddling people in his congregation. He has no problem 
saying what needs to be said. If you look at John, uh, uh, 1 John 2, verse 4, it says this, If someone claims to know God but doesn't obey God's commands, I've inserted this here, the words of Jesus in the revelation of Scripture is what he's referring to. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. He's got no problem calling people out for their garbage. Again, in this we see this emphasis on being rooted in Scripture, the authority of Scripture, how this is the thing that informs everything about our faith, belief, and practice as it comes to following Jesus. In this community, in these churches around Asia Minor, some people had taken a lot of liberties with the message of the gospel, claiming to have new insights from the Holy Spirit, teaching new things that they were like, God revealed this to me. Now that would be marvelous, except for the fact that these new insights, these new insights denied the divinity of Jesus, taught people that they could be sinless without salvation, and taught that God introduced sin into the world. All of these things are contrary to Scripture. In terms of our series, these are teachings that were way out of orbit, just off the star charts, just gone. Rather than submitting themselves to the authority of God's revelation, these people who had popped up wanted to label their own opinions and sensibilities as authoritative. They didn't want to submit to God's word. They wanted to understand the world on their own terms. And John had no time for it. He was not weak when it came to calling these people out on this. These people were actively leading others away from Jesus and causing conflict in a church a place that should be known for its love, its unity, its service. These people were causing problems. And John calls them exactly what they are. A little bit later on in chapter 2, you can see it. He calls them antichrists, which is a very strong term for anybody who's been into any sort of eschatological stuff in the last little while. That's a strong term, antichrists. That's obviously not his term term of endearment. That's not a way for John to sort of pad the message a little bit here. He's not trying to go and say, you guys are a little bit like off base here. Um, I hear where you're coming from. I hear what you're saying. I want to validate your feelings. But can we roll it back a little bit? That's not John trying to protect his pastoral leadership. That's John coming out and saying to these people, you are leading people away from Jesus. You are literally anti-Christ. This call to love one another, this call to emulate the nature of God is not a weak stance that just rolls over and says, I don't want to fight. Love delights in the truth and has no room for deception. And so in the face of conflict, division, and junk theology, John calls on the people of the church to cling to the truth as it has been revealed. He goes and he, he calls out bad theology for what it is. These people over here, they are working against the kingdom of God. Have nothing to do with them. Don't be like that. Instead, be like this. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God and anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love this passage was written in response to a serious crisis of community and truth as the pastor of these churches John reminds his people that there is no need to get into the squabbles and drive the hurt even deeper. We already know that these people are being anti-God. So just don't have anything to do with it. Don't make things worse. Just hold to the truth. The ones who are far from God expose themselves for what they are when they stray from Scripture and when they stir up division and hurt. 
they identify themselves right away. They know, you know exactly what kingdom they are committed to. For the people of God, John teaches that rather than getting dragged into the fray, the people of God should cling to the truth and love one another authentically because God is love. I'm going to examine that concept just a little bit closer here. God is love. So what does that actually mean? Does that mean that love is God in that case? Can we reverse that? If theology was like algebra, then yeah, that kind of makes sense. But functionally, it's not true. That's not what we read from Scripture. That's not what we know from God's revealed nature in His Word. According to Scripture, it wasn't love that spoke creation into being. Love didn't make people in its image. Love didn't create God. The Bible describes God as the source of life, and here we see God telling us, or sorry, John telling us that God is also the source of love. God is love. He is the source of it. God's eternal nature is to or yeah, God's eternal nature is to love. It's because he loves that he put creation into place. It was out of love that he created humanity in his image. And it's because he loves that he offers salvation. You look at Romans 5 verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The love of God goes beyond affection. The love of God is redeeming. The Bible also describes God as holy, which means that he is completely separate from the rest of creation. As the creator, he is completely separate from the rest of creation. That doesn't mean that he has withdrawn himself from creation. It means that nothing in creation compares to him. Nothing is like him. He alone, among everything, is holy. Anything that is made holy is made holy by him. His holiness does not tolerate sin, which is anything that works against his purpose. Sinful people cannot enter into God's presence, but because God is love, because everything that he does comes from love, is motivated by love, he made a way for sinful people to be reconciled back to himself. Love does not define God. Instead, God defines love by his nature. And because God is love, the people of God must also be marked as individuals and a community of love. And again, that doesn't mean this weird group of spaced out people that live in a commune and call each other brother and sister. It's not what it's about. When Jesus gave the greatest commandment, he said that following God faithfully comes down to two things. Love God and love others. To love God means to obey his commands, which according to John 14. If you love me, obey my commands. To obey God, you must know him and what he commands. And that means studying scripture, sp practicing spiritual disciplines, and submitting to what the Spirit reveals in concert with scripture. Know God, obey him, trust him, understand, know his voice, recognize him, and obey him to what he calls you to do. Now, to love others means to emulate Jesus, boldly speaking the truth in love, ministering to the poor, bringing justice to the marginalized, calling out corruption and having compassion for your enemies. Love is not a passive stance. Love for others is not a passive stance. When the people of God are committed to obeying the Spirit in them, the love of God that pours out is the greatest witness the church can offer. It is active. It is alive. It delights in the truth. It doesn't tolerate wrongdoing. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God.
But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For John writing to this community, this community that is tearing itself apart, this community that is facing a crisis when it comes to the truth of Scripture, he calls them back to what is central, to what we can know for sure of God, rather than these assumptions, these things that people have tried to make sense of God with. He calls them back to the core of who God has revealed himself to be. God is love. Have no room for lies and have no room for division. Love one another. There are a couple of questions that I want to leave you with as we wrap up our time this morning. And the first one is this. What does it look like for the church to hold to the truth in love? Because there are going to be times when we're going to be challenged by teaching that comes from outside of Scripture. This whole series is about establishing the theological heart of our faith. So how do we stand when things pop up that are contrary to Scripture? The first way and the thing that I will always, 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 always come back to is do we know the Word of God inside and out? Do we know the general, genuine article so well that we cannot be fooled when something fake comes along? When something outside of it is revealed to it, or when somebody goes and says, I've got this new revelation. We say, okay, let's go and check your work. We're not going to be fooled if we know the genuine article, but we need to be faithful in studying it. Do we know the truth? Are we so steeped in it that no matter how much, or that we are and familiar with the voice of Jesus, that we know it so well that we can't be fooled by these things that are anti-Christ that show up? Do these things inspire fear in us? Perfect love drives out fear. Are we familiar with the voice of Jesus? Does he fill us with confidence? Does he fill us with calm? Do we know his voice well enough that we're not going to be fooled by somebody claiming to be him? That's one thing. But here's the other part of that. When we do encounter things that are false, what does it look like to cling to the truth in love so that we don't create an environment of infighting, tension, and anger? So we don't go on these huge crusades where we're going and setting up big public debates where we go and try and dunk on our enemies. This is my suggestion. Stick with me for a second here because it gets crazy. I don't know if you've ever encountered this before, but uh, there is legitimately a group of people out there who believe that the earth is flat and that there's a worldwide conspiracy that wants to hide this fact from everybody. And if you think it's silly, it is, but it's there. I've encountered these people in real life, and I've learned this. Don't engage with nonsense. Do not engage with nonsense. If someone wants to reject what is plainly true, there is no evidence in the world that is going to satisfy them. It's just not going to work. They will only drag you down into a foolish and fruitless argument. I know because they've dragged me down into a foolish and fruitless argument. I've been mad for days because somebody wouldn't listen to reason. It's better to simply hold to the truth than to engage with an argument that's flawed from the root. Cling to the truth, trusting that eventually the truth will prevail. It's similar when it comes to junk theology. I don't engage with a flawed premise because there's no that has no root in Scripture. I simply hold to what I know to be true. I will reiterate what I know to be true. It's not that I don't share what is true. I don't engage with the argument. That doesn't mean I reject people who believe differently from me. I simply don't debate things that reject Scripture. It's not worth it. In your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared with an an to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
It's not sidestepping or avoiding. It's simply refusing to leave solid ground to get dragged down into a marsh. That old adage, don't ever wrestle with the pig. The pig already wanted to be dirty. You're going to be dirty and the pig's going to be happy regardless. Hold to the truth. Reiterate the truth. Never let go of the truth. Don't get dragged down into hateful arguments. Here's the last thing. When people encounter our church, when they encounter you at the coffee shop, on the road, at work, in your home, do they see the nature of God in us? Do they experience God when they have an encounter with our church or with us individually? When they see our church, do they see a group of people committed to Jesus who live in peace with one another? In many ways, I think that we do a good job of demonstrating God's love to the community. This yard sale coming up, this is just one example of that. It's a way of serving the community and inviting people to participating in serving some of the poorest people on the planet. This is a good thing. This is a good witness. I am ecstatic about this thing. I love it when I see new people come and join us on a Sunday morning and you people welcome them with open arms. I love watching that. Here's the other side of it, though. This church has existed for 75 years. You don't get to exist for 75 years without some things coming up. It's hard to admit, but it's the truth. There have been hurts and things that have been mishandled in this church, whether by leadership or by others. And I don't want to get specific up here because that's not what this is about. But I do want to challenge you with this question. Is the love of God evident in our community in the way that we disagree with one another? Is the love of God evident in our community in the way that we handle it when we've hurt others? What does it look like for the love of God to be evident in the way that we deal with things that have gone wrong in the past? Do we seek forgiveness when we've hurt others? Do we forgive the people who have hurt us? Is our church a safe place to disagree with one another? In many ways, yes. Every once in a while, I screw up on that. I know that there are times where we failed at that, and I am so sorry to anyone who has been hurt within the walls of this church. But here's the hopeful part. God's love is redeeming. In spite of the hurts, in spite of the mistakes, God still loves, and his love is redeeming. Those hurts can't be undone, but we can seek reconciliation. We may may not be able to unsay some things, but we can humble ourselves and seek forgiveness. We may have differences in our views, but we can work to be united around the core truth of God's nature. Because God is love, let this church, let our church family, let our individual lives be a beacon of that love so that when people encounter encounter the body of Christ here in Alberta Beach, they have an experience of who God is at the core. When people see us, let them know that God is love. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the way that you have revealed yourself. And we thank you, God, that you are not distant, that you are not impersonal, but that, Lord, you are intimate and close, and that you love each and every one of us, that you loved us before 
we started following you, that you love us when we have messed up and sinned, that you love us enough to call us back to yourself. Like the father and the prodigal son, you wait for us to return. And we thank you, God, for that love. We pray, Lord, that it would be evident, that it would continue to be evident in our own congregation. That, Lord, you would draw our attention to the times when we have not been as faithful as we should have been. That, Lord, you would show us how to make those things, if not right, that, God, you would show us how to, at the very least, take responsibility for those things so they do not happen again. We ask, God, that you would give us the grace to be united with one another, to bear with one another's shortcomings and one another's burdens. You would give us the grace to hear one another while God keeping us firmly anchored to the truth of your word, never compromising, never losing sight of who you are, never losing sight of the truth that salvation comes through you alone. And we pray, God, that by that witness, many more would be added to your kingdom. As they experience, they touch, they see, they smell, they taste what it's like in your kingdom, that, God, they would come to a saving relationship with you. We pray these things together now, Jesus, in your name. Amen.